So we're interested in this transition dipole moment when, under what conditions, this is equal to zero and a transition is forbidden, and under what conditions it's not equal to zero and the transition's allowed, and in particular, what values of L and M make this forbidden or allowed. So to explore that a little further, let's recall for the rigid rotor, specifically the form of these wave functions for the rigid rotor, the wave function for quantum numbers L and M, angular momentum quantum number L, magnetic quantum number M, there's a normalization constant. There's a piece that looks like a Legendre polynomial in cosine theta. And then there's the uh, exponential term that has this e to the i m phi with the quantum number m. So if we're thinking about how to plug rigid rotor wave functions into this expression in the general case, that's the form we'll use. The lm wave function with the complex conjugate the, if I write down what this looks like for the complex conjugated form, the constant might need to be complex conjugated. The Legendre polynomials are not imaginary. They don't have any imaginary portion, so I don't have to do anything there. And for this e to the i m phi, the con complex conjugate just turns the i into a negative i. And then if I write down what that looks like for the L prime m prime piece, it's just going to be a different normalization constant, a different Legendre polynomial, and then e to the i m prime phi that doesn't get a negative sign because that one doesn't get complex conjugated. If I insert those into the transition dipole moment, what we have is, and I'll go ahead and simplify a little bit as we do this, pulling the constants outside of the integral. Wave function number one, wave function number two both have constants. The dipole moment is constant. So the constants out front are two normalization constants and a dipole moment. The integral, uh, the theta dependent portions of the integral, I've got a PLM from wave function LM and I've got a P prime, PL prime M prime from the second wave function and then I've also got some cosine thetas one here and a sine theta from here. And then, so that's my theta integral. The phi integral, I have a d phi here, and then the phi dependence of these wave functions is this e to the minus i m phi, e to the plus i m prime phi, all multiplied by d phi and integrated over phi. So that's the integral we need to evaluate to determine whether the transition is forbidden or allowed in particular looking for anything that could cause either of these two integrals to go to zero. So we'll go ahead and do that and we'll start with the uh, integral, the phi integral that involves this magnetic quantum number because that one's a little bit easier. And we'll consider two separate cases. Case number one, let's consider the possibility that the final quantum number is equal to the initial quantum number. So the quantum number, the magnetic quantum number is not changing as the transition happens. So we could also say that as delta m is equal to zero. When we do that, if we evaluate this particular integral, I'll write that integral as e to the i uh, m prime minus m phi, just combining these two exponentials into one. So that's the integral I want to perform m prime minus m, that's the same thing as this delta m. And under this case that we're considering, when delta m is equal to zero, this integral e to the zero phi, that's just one. So because we're considering the case where the quantum number is not changing, this integral, this exponential is one, and I'm just integrating d phi from zero to two pi, which evaluates to two pi, but more importantly, it evaluates to something that's not zero. So that transition is allowed. If the quantum number m is not changing, this phi contribution to the transition dipole moment is non-zero, and that uh, doesn't kill the transition dipole moment, that transition is allowed. On the other hand, if we consider the case where the final magnetic quantum number is not the same as the initial quantum number, so this delta m 
is something non-zero, maybe it's increasing by one or decreasing by one, whatever it is it's doing, it's changing, then this integral, integral of e to the i m prime minus m is the thing we're calling delta m, e to the i delta m phi integrated over phi from zero to two pi. That's just an exponential integral. I've got e to, it looks a little scary because it's got imaginary numbers in, up in the exponent, but the integral of an exponential is just an exponential. With a one over i and delta m uh, in front, so that if I were to take the derivative of this function, that, that i and delta m will cancel this i and delta m and leave me with just the exponential that I was taking the integral of. So that is the integral. I want to evaluate that between 0 and 2 pi. So I'm going to get 1 over i delta m e to the i times delta m times 2 pi. So I'll write that as e to the 2 pi uh, times i times delta m. And the second term, I've got e to the i delta m times 0, so e to the 0 is just going to be 1. But this is a fairly convenient result. One of the, the few things we need, need to know about imaginary numbers to deal with them in these uh, in rigid rotor wave functions is uh, the fact that we're going to use in this next step is that e to the 2 pi times i is equal to 1, as is e to the 4 pi times i, as is e to the 6 pi times i, e to any integer, any even multiples of pi times i up in the exponent, that is equal to 1. That's just a feature of the imaginary constant i. So e to the 2 pi i may be times 1 or negative 1 or 2 or negative 2. Some uh, change in the quantum number, magnetic quantum number, this whole first term is equal to 1. So what we have is 1 minus 1 inside the parentheses, and this whole integral comes out to be equal to 0. So it turns out that any time the magnetic quantum number does change, if there is a change in the magnetic quantum number, the phi contribution to the transition dipole moment will work out to be 0. That will make the entire transition dipole moment equal to 0, and that will be a forbidden transition. So what that uh, results in is the general statement that if we want to induce a transition between some initial state and some final state using electromagnetic radiation, using light, then the requirement is that the transition we want to initiate cannot change the magnetic uh, quantum number. The delta m must be zero in order for that transition to be allowed. So that's the first of two selection rules that we can determine for rigid rotors. That's the one that determines how the value of m should behave. We can take a look at this theta integral and determine how the value of l should behave if we want that transition to be allowed. And that's what we'll tackle next.